Hello friends. I'm standing here in the Alpine Tundra in Denali National Park and I marvel. It's the middle of October. A week and a half ago this place was blanketed in snow. It was freezing cold. An icy wind. The road was closed. Now the snow is gone. This is perfect hiking weather. This past week it's been in the single digits in Montana and Idaho. Here in Alaska today at 4,000 feet in elevation, it's in the upper 40s. There's not even a breeze on the air. And behind me is the highest mountain in North America, 20,387 feet maybe? Uh, don't quote me on that. Denali, the Great One. How I marvel that the Lord has allowed us to behold this view on such a perfect day. And I've got one thing to say. All praise to the maker of the mountain! Folks, you may not even be able to see it as the camera videotapes. Because no man-made device, no human technology can compare with the focus and the detail of the human eye. But we can see it. It stands out stark. I see the North Peak that was first summited by that sourdough expedition. Some miners with a bag of donuts went up there and placed a flagpole. But the true peak is the South Peak. Some, like Dr. Cook, claimed to have climbed it. His story proved to be a farce. It was first summited in 1913, I believe, by a Christian missionary by the name of Hudson Stuck. He reached the South Summit going up the uh, uh, Karstens Ridge with a partner and two natives. And when Stuck got to the summit, he made a comment, or he later wrote in his uh, memoir of the ascent about the scientists who gather their records and their their calculations and their instruments and they take their measurements and they look at things through the eyes of a scientist and think they're so smart they can name off uh, scientific names without even knowing what they mean they can throw around Latin terms without even knowing what they stand for even in Stuck's day these so-called scientists sounded like the college professors of our universities all they know how to do is regurgitate the college student today doesn't know how to research we go to these campuses, we share Christ, we talk about the fallacies of evolution, and just like this young man on the University of Alaska Fairbanks the other day, they spew forth fairy tales. He said that numerous transitional species has been, had been discovered in the fossil record. Friends, there's never been a transitional species discovered in the fossil record. Darwin even said that was a great problem in his book. He said one of the big problems with my theory is that we can't find transitional species and he predicted that many of them would be found in years to come. Friends, it's been what, 150 years since Darwin? We still haven't found any? Then this young man appealed to Archaeopteryx, a fossil found that was proven to be a bird. Some tried to say it was a transition between a reptile and a bird, but it was proven to be a bird. And then you've got the bones that they find and claim to be uh, human humanoids predating Homo sapien and they turn out to be the jawbone of a pig or a hoax. Friends, it takes more faith to stand here and look at this scenery and attribute it to tectonic plate movement and the happen chance uh, activities of random uh, occurrence than it does to believe the simple claims of the Bible. The Bible doesn't waste two seconds trying to prove God's existence. It doesn't have to. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He that formeth the mountains, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Stuck knew that. When he stood on that summit, he thought and later wrote, yes, these scientists have all their measurements, and they think they're so smart. But what is more intelligent, to take some readings or to pause and say, how great art thou, O God? How, ma how powerful and majestic is thy name? For thou hast created it all the handiwork of an almighty creator. Now, I'm paraphrasing Archdeacon Stuck's uh, statement, but that's the essence of what he said. He traveled more than 10,000 miles on a dog sled in these parts, bringing the gospel to these isolated peoples. Where are the missionaries like that today? Where are those like William Carey, Adoniram Judson, Archdeacon Stuck, 
who will go to the ends of the earth and proclaim the gospel at all costs, who have the guts to get out of their comfort zone and climb a mountain if need be. If it takes climbing a mountain to spend quality time with those seeking Christ that you might point them to the Savior, will you do it? If it takes living in the bush or riding a bicycle to the top of the continent to speak the gospel in the ears of those that might never hear, will you do it? Jesus Christ said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Tell them we have done so. And we'll do so. But for now, though you may not be able to see it in the camera, the intricate complexity of our human eyes behold this mountain as the handiwork of a mighty creator. Evolution cannot explain the human eye. It's irreducibly complex. You take away one part, it doesn't work. Here I am preaching in the wilderness, but I'm grateful to share these moments with you. I'm just a servant of the Most High God. I've got a faithful partner filming who's traveled with me many miles. We count it a pleasure to stand here and share our thoughts. We're headed up to the summit of Mount Margaret in Primrose Ridge. God bless you, my friends. We'll see you down the trail. Amen. Hey, friends. I'm on the summit of Mount Margaret here. I got to preaching a little while ago and paraphrase that great missionary, Hudson Stuck, who brought the gospel to the interior of Alaska in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But I only thought it appropriate to give you his exact words as he reminisced about those moments uh, to be one of the first to set foot on the summit of Denali, the great one that is so clearly visible behind. As he reflected later in his memoirs of that time on the summit, this is what he said. Oh, the wisdom of man and the apparatus of the sciences, the little columns of mercury that sling up and down, the vacuum boxes that expand and contract, the hammer that chips the highest rocks, the compass that takes the bearings of glacier and ridge, all the equipage of hypsometry and geology and geodesy. How pitifully feeble and childish it seems to cope with the majesty of the mountains. Take them all together. Haul them up the steep. And as they lay there, read or read, recorded, and done for, which shall be more adequate to the whole scene? Their records? Or that simple ancient hymn, We praise thee, O God. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. What an astonishing thing that standing where we stood and seeing what we saw, there are men who should be able to deduce this law or that from their observation of its working and yet be unable to see the lawgiver. Who should be able to push back effect to immediate cause and yet be blind to the supreme cause of all causes. Who can say, this is the glacier's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes and not see Him who in His strength setteth fast the mountains and is girded with power, whose servants the glaciers, the snow, and the ice are, wind and storm fulfilling His word, who exult in the exercise of their own intelligences and the playthings those intelligences have constructed and yet deny the omniscience that endowed them with some minute fragment of itself. It was not always so. It was not so with the really great men who have advanced our knowledge of nature. But of late years, hordes of small men have given themselves up to the study of the physical sciences without any study preliminary. It would almost seem nowadays that whoever can sit in the seat of the scornful may sit in the seat of learning. 